So I've been doing it since about 2000, 2001. And then uh, I met her back in 2017 and she got drug into this world as well. And then we've been hosting shows here at this venue in Bentonville, Arkansas for a couple of years now. My name is Carter and I work here at Cleves. We have owned the business uh, since 2015. We've been around since 1979 um, and we're just kind of a full source hobby shop, wax boxes, cards, supplies, grading advice. Well, I've been collecting my whole life. Um, I started getting real serious in it uh, about 2016 when um, there was a lot of social media about sports cards. A lot of people got into collecting in the 80s and 90s. And then the companies started to overproduce their product. When they started overproducing their product, the values of the cards started to drastically decrease. And um, for many years, all the way up until about mid-2000, uh, so about 2015 or so, prices started to I increase and increase. So it was a prime opportunity from an investment perspective when uh, card prices were so low. The biggest change I felt started at the end of 2019. So the pandemic started socially becoming a pandemic um, early 2020, around the January, February timeframe, where things were starting to shut down. So pandemic has kind of exploded this hobby, um, I think in two fold ways. You had a lot of people that were stuck at home and they started digging out all their old stuff and got excited and interested, again, in sports cards. Um, a lot of those people had kids that they were able to share that with. Um, so you have a whole new generation of collectors as well that are coming in looking for stuff. it is easier to obtain higher end, end cards because there's a lot of people that are obtaining these cards from an investment perspective to sell as a, at a profit. So people are stuck at home, they have social media at their fingertips, they can't leave their home, they can't go to casinos and gamble, sporting events have been shut down. So how people got their high was they started getting into sports cards. Oh, ironically, it yeah. made the business blow it's up. Because people weren't able to go to events and stuff like that. In my opinion, the, the money they, they were getting, they had to spend somewhere. So a lot of people were investing in the sports card market and in sports memorabilia. So it really, Sadly, it really hurt, it really helped the market. Some people do it as an investment. Some people do it because they like a special team or players and they want to collect cards of a player or a team. That's called PC, your personal collection. And some people aren't long haul investors, they're flippers. They will find a good deal with a card that's 50 bucks and then they can turn around and sell it tomorrow for 75, 80 bucks. So you can make 20, 30, 50 bucks per card. And you do that that enough, people can um, supplement their income. It helped, it helped people to get into collecting and they had something to do while they weren't maybe going to restaurants and, and things like that. The United States Postal Service, FedEx, UPS, um, were all really impacted, not just by the pandemic in general, but the increased packages of products flowing from Amazon, flowing from eBay, um, eBay had record sales during the pandemic uh, in, in regards to the sports card category. So eBay has never had that many sales in the sports card category uh, besides 2020. With the excitement within the industry and how many people started to buy and sell, there were a lot of industries that were impacted both negatively as well as positively. During the pandemic, uh, sports card shows shut down, both small towns as well as the large sports card conventions. And that as well fueled the uh, fire of sports cards uh, via social media.
I believe that the local card shops were impacted the heaviest based on the pandemic and the way that distribution occurs and how retail boxes quantities increased. We've also seen a group of collectors that have fallen off since life has kind of gotten a little bit more back to normal um, that were largely in the hobby because they were kind of a captive audience. They were stuck at home, they didn't have anything to do, they couldn't go, you know, pay to go to a football game or a baseball game and so that disposable income went to the next best thing with sports, which was cards. Um, so we've seen the pandemic create a new collector base, but we've also seen it um, take away some collectors that, that started during the pandemic. In the early 2000s, local card shops started to die out because the big boom in the 80s and 90s that really fueled the growth for local car card shops, but they started to close up shops. And the way that cards are distributed from Tops and Panini, they leverage what, what is called distributors. These distributors have uh, distribution accounts with local card shops. So the older your card shop is, the higher allocation of product that you can get from a distributor. A box of cards like this, 2019 uh, Panini Prism, this box of cards at your local card shop was 300 bucks. And that box went up to $4,000 a box. That priced local card shops that carry hobby boxes out of the business because people no longer had money to pay $2,000, $3,000, $4,000 for a box of cards. So everybody was shifting their focus to retail stores, your Targets, your Walmarts, your Dollar Generals, because those boxes were $20, $25. As Walmart people, the boxes are sold out. You can't find boxes of things anymore unless you come to the shows. So within the retail industry, as the uh, card boom started to occur in late 2019 and in 2020, um, inside of Target and Walmart, um, a lot of flippers, uh, investors, and collectors would be monitoring store stock times. That they'd be talking to store management, talking to store associates. Um, they started to build a network within other uh, uh, collectors within the town to start to understand when does the store stock? Uh, when do they not? Has the store already stocked today? Not a lot of retail stores actually stock the cards themselves. It's actually a th third party a majority of the time. And sometimes uh, the third party stalker would get compromised. If they're making $12, $13 an hour, um, some collectors may pay that person under the table for information. When, when are you gonna come to the store next? There's been some shows that you can watch online that have uh, people that have stolen things, but the good thing is you have a lot of dealers next to each other watching things. Oh, yeah. It doesn't stop at 100%. No, I mean, somebody could walk up with a card from my table and I may not even know it. But um, I know what you're talking about with Walmart and things like that. You know, people come in, but you just have to. I mean, what I would suggest is if you ever decide to set up at a show, definitely invest in showcases. They're not that expensive. Put your mm -hmm. higher dollar things back there. You know, you want to trust people, but things you know there are people out there that are doing bad things and you just have to you have to be careful and then you know these are investments so take care of your investments it caused a big ruckus within the industry and hobby in general around that what we called bad actors you got a lot of bad actors out there that are maliciously getting an advantage instead of just using a good network of people to help and get, get cards from um, um, retail store properly. Uh, some other things were happening where people were um, impersonating the suppliers and going into stores and getting boxes and walking out the store with these boxes pretending to be vendors and suppliers. Um, this is all just common knowledge that has been communicated within the industry, whether it's true or not, I don't know. You know, whenever news like that hits the social me media waves within all of these social me media groups um, and a lot of the different in instances that it occurs, you have to assume that it's true. Yeah, people do do their homework. I mean, if you, people right now, the pricing isn't what it used to be. It used to be a Beckett price guide and you'd use that and that would give you the high and low values. 
right now a lot of the values come off of eBay. With the, a card is only worth what someone's willing to pay on. So a lot of the values that we use, and you'll see at any show, you know, if you're looking to bring cards to a show to sell to a dealer, do your homework on those. If they sell for $20 on eBay, don't expect a dealer to give you $20 on it because they need to make some money too. But also don't take a $2 offer for it. I mean, understand what you have before you bring it to a show to sell it to somebody. So during the pandemic, you had, again, a captive audience at home that didn't have a, a way to go do anything, sporting events or, or whatnot, or even um, go, you know, spend a Saturday at the casino or anything. So um, you had these people that got into these breaks that realized that this is an exciting way to have some fun at home, be able to see stuff happen live and interact with other people without um, physically being together, which um, was a great addition to the hobby that was already kind of there but that just was able to be boosted and you know connecting people together and people um, interacting and and growing together and more more collectors being able to find stuff that they like one thing i do want to hone in on though is financially people having money in their pockets there's more access there's now more people with money that understand the financial a aspect of it social media really really enables um, collectors to learn from each other. So if you can build a really good network and start to learn from others, it enables you to rapidly, um, from a speed perspective, to understand the industry to be able to liquidate and sell cards. Every time that a government check would arrive at someone's household, we started seeing sales of sports cards rise. Collectors and investors would actually hold on to their cards to wait for the government checks to uh, clear, to start posting in these social media groups, um, as well as on eBay for uh, cards on for sale. The people. The good, I was going to say people. my favorite parts. The it's people. It's not about the cards for us. It's just meeting some good people and. and the, you know, our dealers are great, our people that come into the show, it's just fun talking to people and their experience in life, whether it's sports related or, or not. So, we got some, we've met some really, really good people in, in, in the business. Good reputation and having a good network, it actually enables you to liquidate product quick. So you, that's called working capital. So you can sell your cards more rapidly if you have good clientele and you have a good reputation. So there's a few things. You can buy um, sealed wax boxes and you can open those boxes and try to get what we call in the industry hits. Or you can buy uh, raw cards or graded cards and try to flip those for money. So a lot of people will buy sealed wax, open it up, try to get a hit. They will buy raw cards and graded. What really made a big boom in 2018, 2019 was the term breakers. This is where people that may not have a lot of money to pay for three, five, seven hundred dollar boxes, they'll buy in for a smaller portion where you may uh, get into a break that is random 32 teams or 30 teams for basketball. It gets randomized. So that way you're paying 30, 32 bucks to get one or two teams instead of having to put forth so much money for a full box. Breakers started to uh, compound uh, exponentially socially. So Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, um, all of those forums really allowed for breakers to have these collectors, investors at their fingertips. We were lucky in the area here during COVID, we were still able to hold shows with the social distancing and masks. And um, it was fun. We, we played, you know, we did the masks and um, we, we did everything. We, were, we followed all the guidelines. So whenever conventions started back up, it was an exciting time within the hobby. It, it enabled um, a lot of new people that through the year and a half of a pandemic and uh, staying at home and learning and growing through social me media, it enabled them to now get out and experience sports card shows, sports card conventions. And 
we had one of the biggest shows in the country yeah. <laughs> last year because so many areas had to shut down. But um, we were fortunate in this area that we were able to hold at least some sort of event. So sports card shows have been around for 20, 30 years. Um, a lot of them are smaller towns where they could have anywhere from 10 tables to 100 or 200 tables. Uh, for instance, today in this town, there is a sports card show at the mall today. From a convention perspective, that is uh, where large gatherings of sports card investors and collectors will come together um, at the masses. These are large convention centers. Um, the one just occurred called the National. Uh, it happens once a year. It's the largest one, had the highest attendance of any um, sports card convention. So um, a lot of new players are coming into the hobby understanding uh, the financial and investment side of the hobby. There's a lot of people that turned out either way, but again, from all, over know, the country, all the guidelines too. that were in place, we still had to follow the guidelines too. Right. But, Temperature um, checks. You know, we, did, we did all that, but still it was so much fun to, to be able to experience things when we weren't really allowed to go out to certain places because you know, a lot of places shut down during the pandemic. Sports cars did not shut down. In fact, sports cars were a lot busier than even like the stock market and stuff like that. Another aspect inside of the industry that has really fueled um, the hobby, and that's around uh, what we call sports card grading. The largest grading company is PSA, and they've been around over 20 years. They are the superior group grading company within the industry. They're the most respected. The company we work for has been around for about uh, 15 years. Before he started this company up, he started the first company called PSA. He got bought out by his partners and started up JSA. So our, our boss has been around this stuff for 35 years. It's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of trained opinions, a lot of trained eye, a lot of experience. I've personally been collecting autographs for over 30 years. Uh, so you kind of learn different things in the hobby and stuff like that. And also on my computer, I have an exemplar of over a million different autographs of everybody from Elvis to Hitler to Mickey Mantle, because everybody collects something. What grading actually does is it enables an investor, a collector, to have a professional opinion that that card is real and what the condition is of the card. There's a grading scale um, for most companies, which is from a one to a 10. 10 being a gem mint pristine. One means the card's really, really rough, could have some creases in it. And the value drastically differs from a, a PSA 10 to a PSA one. It's good for people that want to know if their items are real, also for uh, uh, insurance purposes, and also to help resell, because you know some people are looking to resell stuff. So I, I think it adds quite a bit. Uh, but but let's say, for instance, you have a baseball signed by Mickey Mantle, unauthenticated. It may only be worth 150 bucks. Is about the most you'll get offered. Authenticated, it's 750 bucks. So it could be five, six hundred dollar difference just by getting getting the authentication done. And it definitely helps. Helps resale, helps for insurance purposes. Investors can buy a raw card for $10, send it into PSA or BGS and hope for a 10. And if it gets to be a 10, depending on the card and the player and the rarity, that $20 card could potentially turn into three or $400 card. There was also a really fun publication uh, during the National that said, kids have money. Um, uh, some of the big spenders at the National were kids, uh, 15 and under. So um, that type of excitement and new people getting into the hobby and getting to experience sports card shows and conventions is exciting. There's a lot of kids in here too, this is awesome. Oh yeah, the kids. This is the yeah. future yeah. Guys, of, of card trayers. You know, how do you keep the kids interested when they go to Walmart and they can't find a box? You know, you hand out free, you know, as a dealer, I'll give out free cards to them. I'll, you know, a lot of the other dealers will do special things for them too. It's just, it's the right thing to do. And how do you, how do you want kids get interested in things they have fun doing, whether it's a video game or whatever, so. And ask questions, because that's how I've learned uh, about it. Find somebody and ask a question. Don't be afraid yeah. to, you know, sound 
I was afraid I'd sound stupid. When, but but I mean, don't be. I mean, it's <laughs> right, right, it's right. exciting. I like to share what I've learned over the last couple of years. And most people, I think, are. This is what excites me from an industry perspective is there's a lot of fans from a sports perspective that have never really been focused on within the sports card industry, like UFC, wrestling, uh, Formula One, women's sports, uh, soccer. So there's a lot of industries that are now starting to get focused by Panini and Tops. And uh, it's really, really starting to grow. It's for the whole family. It's not just uh, kids in a baseball league or for grown men. I mean, women are in this, and that's growing in popularity. I mean, some women groups. She's, a, um, she's in several women groups. It's yes. just women in sports cars. And, yeah. you know, 15, 20 years ago, you didn't see many women. It was all, you look around right now, most of the dealers are guys. You see a lot more wives showing up or girlfriends. For the first time in 2019, women's basketball, WNBA, got their own uh, production line of cards. Series one came out, and um, they are now on, on their series two uh, for WNBA Prism. Formula One is hot right now. If they want to set up and, and at a show, um, I tell them just to have fun, plan on having a good time, <laughs> bring what you would you want to sell. Um, if you're a new in, in cards, because I'm pretty new, it, what I learned is pick somebody you like. You don't have to go after what everybody else goes after. It's more of a personal preference, not a societal thing. It, like I like Emmett Smith, so now that's my what I go look for. <laughs> and then she touched on it, the biggest thing is enjoy it. If you're not enjoying it, you may be in the wrong house. So coming out of the pandemic now, I mean, we're still kind of in it, but coming out of it, we've seen a boom and I think it's been a big positive for the hobby. It's exciting, it's fun, people want to collect again, and we're seeing a, a rebirth of this industry like we never have before.